pray this prayer together. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. You are worthy, Lamb of God, for you were slain, and with your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Can I ask you to join me as we pray for God's help before we hear God's word read? Thank you, Father, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. Open our hearts to receive your word that we may know you better and be thoroughly equipped for every good work through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's reading comes from Esther chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and to plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal province now know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king accepts, extends the golden scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and the deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the end of the reading. Our Bible reading this morning is from Acts chapter 24, but beginning at chapter 23, verse 31, I'm reading from the New International Version. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. 
The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms to this nation, and everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. The Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defence. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. All these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, uh, that's enough for now, you may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison.
Good morning all. I'm so glad you're watching us today on Church Online and I'd like to begin by saying we're going to be reading Acts chapter 24 together. Courtroom dramas seem to hold a fascination for many people. Certainly for the media in our country, they're so keen to report on trials. They show us the reactions of those on trial. They show us those who are prosecuting the case and those who are hoping for a verdict one way or the other. Today's passage takes us to the third of five trials that the Apostle Paul had to endure and the first one before a Roman governor. In this case, the Roman governor was Felix, who, like Pilate, was the procurator of all Judea. Felix was the procurator between 52 AD and 59 AD. I want to look at it under three headings. The accusers of Paul and their accusations. Paul's defence of those accusations. And then the decision reached by Felix. Hopefully, as we look at those three things, we can learn some things that will be profitable for our own walk with God. The accusers then and their accusations. Paul's accusers were Annas the high priest and some other Jewish elders. These were the same Jewish leaders who'd been inciting crowd violence against Paul in Jerusalem and who now, in the hope of securing the death penalty, as they'd tried to do and succeeded in the case of Jesus, had taken the extra step of having him brought before the Roman governor in Caesarea. And this time, to present their case, they brought with them Tertullus, a skilled lawyer and orator. Before presenting the charges, Tertullus began in verses 2 through to 4 with what in Latin was called a captatio benevolentia, an attempt to capture the judge's goodwill with what we might call flattery, a piece telling Felix how good the Jews thought he was. He begins, We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, Felix, and your foresight has brought about a long period of peace and has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. The only problem with all that flattery was it wasn't true. As a sheer hypocrisy. Roman history records Felix was a governor who put down insurrections with barbarous brutality and under whom there was very little peace and prosperity. And not long after this trial, he was recalled to Rome. But let me come to the charges and accusations made by Tertullus and the Jewish leaders they enumerated three charges. One, Paul was a troublemaker, a creator of dissension. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. This was a serious accusation with political overtones. There were many Jewish agitators who threatened the peace. To excite dissension, under the Roman Empire was considered treason. And as I've indicated, they were usually put down with ruthless authority. Tertullus wanted to put Paul in the same league as those troublemakers and rebels. Their second charge was that he was a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, an unauthorized sect of Jesus' followers also contrary to Roman law. And their third accusation 
was he even tried to profane or desecrate the temple. This was really the only specific charge against him. Though Tertullus offered no proof, no witnesses to this charge, it was simply he even tried to desecrate the temple. He finished by simply suggesting that Felix ought to examine Paul and learn for himself the truth of these charges. So they were the charges made by the Jews, three of them. He was a troublemaker, he was a leader of the sect of the Nazarenes or the followers of Jesus, and he desecrated their temple. We come now, secondly, to Paul's defence against these accusations. Paul was not new to persecution, and he knew that he had nothing to fear from the truth. But he knew that truth didn't always win out in a court of law. In fact, Paul rather entrusted himself, as he tells the Corinthian church, to the highest judge of all, the judge of all the earth. As he wrote in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 2, and in these verses following, it is required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little, he said, if I am judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. So that the invitation of Felix, he begins his defence. Without resorting to any flattery of Felix at all, but with a simple acknowledgement of Felix's authority as the governor of Judea, he begins. He said, <clears throat> it would be very easy to verify that his accusers did not find him arguing with anybody in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city for that matter. So he tells Felix that his accusers cannot prove such charges. He then proceeds to answer the most serious charge concerning being a follower of Jesus by trying to explain to Felix that following Jesus is not just being a sect, but rather it being a follower of the way means still worshipping the God of their fathers. He explained how he believes that following Jesus accords with everything written in the law and the prophets. He tells Felix he has the same hope in God as his accusers, that there will be a resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. He said, I came to Jerusalem to bring gifts to the poor and present offerings. I was ceremonially clean and there was no disturbance or any witnesses to any disturbance whatsoever. If anything, he told Felix, I'm on trial because of my strong belief in the resurrection. So he faithfully, truthfully, and carefully defended the three charges. So we come thirdly through to the decision reached by Felix. The only problem is, there was no decision. Felix, we're told in the book of Acts, had an accurate knowledge of the way, and he could see that Paul was innocent, and could, like Pilate, did with Jesus, or wanted to do with Jesus, he could have set him free. But he didn't do that. He put it off on the pretense of waiting for the commander Lysias to come. But in the meantime, he offered Paul generous liberty. What followed then was most interesting indeed. Along with his wife, Drusilla, a Jewess, Felix visited Paul. Drusilla had been seduced by Felix from her first husband, and became Felix's third wife, which helps explain the topics 
Paul reasoned with them both about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, topics which many modern preachers often avoid speaking about. Topics that we read made Felix very afraid. The first two, righteousness and self-control, were not very evident in the lives of either Felix or Drusilla. Let me ask you, does hearing the gospel of Jesus make people afraid? The Christian philosopher Blaise Pascal once said, most people hate Christianity and are afraid of it lest they find it to be true. Maybe there's someone like that who's tuned in to this telecast today. You know things in your life are not right. You don't have certainty about happens, what happens when you die. You're hoping for something, but you have no assurance. Jesus is speaking to you today. He's saying, do not put it off. Do not do a Felix and Drusilla and keep putting off making a decision about Jesus. That's what Felix did. He sent Paul away and said, at a convenient time, I will come and call for you and speak to you again. Unwilling to declare any faith in Jesus, he kept putting it off. But the Bible tells us, friends, that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. We know that for many people, tomorrow never comes. You only have to read your news, watch your news on TV. People are going about their day and uh, suddenly there's an accident. Suddenly uh, corona strikes or whatever it is. And there's no tomorrow. We should not put off today what we should be doing. Today we should not put it off till tomorrow because tomorrow may never come. You could contact us if you would like to talk about accepting Jesus. You could contact St Paul's on the address that's now given on the screen. We would love to talk with you so that you don't keep putting off making that decision Maybe you walked with Jesus when you were younger and then somehow through your teenage years or later you got away from it. Please get in touch with us so that we can talk to you about being a follower of the way, a follower of the way of Jesus, the offer of salvation, of forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. We would love to share that with you. So please get in touch with us as soon as you can. What we discover about Felix, as well as keeping putting off the decision, he was actually waiting for a bribe. He was hoping that Paul and his friends might have come up with some money that would help Felix to continue to live the lifestyle that he was living. He would be waiting a long time if he was waiting to get a bribe from the Apostle Paul. Finally, when no bribe came along and simply acting out of pure political advantage to do the Jews a favour, he left him in jail for longer than the two-year uh, two period that was allowable under this sort of offence. So what are the lessons we can learn from chapter 24 of Acts? Well, <clears throat> firstly... We're reminded by this that there are many Christians who've been imprisoned simply for believing in Jesus. And it will be so until Jesus returns. For well, Jesus said, just as they've persecuted me, so they will persecute you. We must continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in over 150 countries around the world where many of them have been imprisoned and tortured for follow, being a follower of Jesus. We must encourage those people to entrust themselves to the judge of all the earth, 
as the Apostle Paul did. Secondly, though it's not the main lesson, may I remind you that flattery is not something that Christians ought to use. In Proverbs 20.19 and Romans 16.18 and Jude 1.16, Christians are strongly urged to avoid flattery. Flattery is lying. Flattery is not telling the truth. Rather, we are encouraged to tell the truth to people in love. So flattery is not to be known amongst Christians. Thirdly, Paul's courageous witness to Christ and willingness to confront Felix and Drusilla with strong words serve as a lesson to us to be courageous witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have opportunities when we're talking with friends, talking with people in our community, in the groups we mix with. We have opportunities to share our faith in many different ways. Will we be courageous like the Apostle Paul and talk about the truth or will we shy away from it? The Western world, religious uh, followers of Jesus Christ are kind of being sort of gently put on the back burner. Many of us have been asked this week to write in about religious uh, liberty and discrimination in support of a bill to that effect that we will not be discriminated against. We can take action. Fourthly, the response of Felix and Drusilla will always serve as a reminder, do not put off today until tomorrow a decision you should be making now, that is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There may be no time to respond in the future. Respond today. Again, you could uh, respond to that address on the screen that we gave you. Get in touch with us. Talk to us about following Jesus. We would love to encourage you. So we can take lessons from the Apostle Paul's courage, from his being not afraid of the truth, for his not being afraid to confront Drusilla and Felix with the truth, and we can be encouraged to continue to be a strong witness for Jesus Christ ourselves. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson that we've had today from Acts chapter 24. Write these words in our heart and if we need to take action, we pray you'll help us not to put it off again, but to follow up, get in touch and uh, see what we need to do to continue to grow in our Christian life and get in touch again with following Jesus. Father, we make these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen.
declare together what we believe. I'm going to ask a question and then we will say the Apostles' Creed together. Do you believe in God the Father? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in God the Son? We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He descended, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everybody. We come now to a time of prayer. Please join me. Heavenly Father, as we meet this morning, we do so knowing that we are sinful people, saved only by your grace and mercy. We respond to your love with this verse from Psalm 80. Restore us, O God, Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. And with that verse in mind, we bring our prayers before you in the certain knowledge that you will respond in a way that is best for us. We pray firstly for our nation. Father, we uphold all governments in Australia, praying firstly for our Prime Minister Scott Morrison the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, and all the elected members of the federal parliament. We thank you that our Prime Minister has a strong personal faith in Jesus. We pray that he and the other Christian members of parliament will speak your truth and seek outcomes which reflect your unchanging love for all mankind. We pray that our country will be generous in times of need thinking particularly of the people of Lebanon and the almost impossible circumstances in which they now stand. May we offer real support to our neighbours in PNG, Indonesia, the Pacific Islands and of course New Zealand. We uphold our State Premier Gladys Berejiklian and the Leader of the State Opposition Jody McKay. We look for genuine integrity in all ministers. We pray that the public can be confident that favouritism, nepotism and cronyism will not influence decisions made in our name. We pray that openness, honesty and the national interest will be the prevailing drivers of government. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray now for matters relating to COVID-19. Father, it appears that we are moving into a second wave of this pandemic. And so we are again faced with the need for vigilance, for personal protection and for cooperation throughout the community. 
May our church and our members be leaders in this regard. May we show that life can still be lived with Jesus as our Lord and may we witness your love in our relationships and interactions with others. We do pray that common sense will prevail in the matter of closed state borders. We pray for those people seriously disrupted in their work or daily life, particularly in the major border communities. Father, we pray especially today for our health care community, thinking of Dr Kerry Chant, Chief Medical Officer, Brad Hazard, Minister for Health, and the thousands of doctors, nurses, administrators and military personnel involved in managing this crisis. We thank you for the skills evident in our virus tracking teams and for the excellent science that they employ. Make them aware of our gratitude and of your love, we pray, through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. We pray for all Victorians as they battle their second wave and we thank you for the positive signs that are emerging. We grieve with all those residents of aged care facilities as they face an uncertain future. We do pray for clarity in legislative oversight of aged care and for the provision of proper levels of resource. Father, we uphold Daniel Andrews, State Premier, his health advisers, and those responsible for enforcement of the rules. Closer to home, we thank you that our local area has been relatively free of the virus, and of course we pray for that to continue. Help us, Father, to be patient and aware of the risks. Father, open our eyes to the implications of our actions and decisions, and help us, we pray, to be mindful of the welfare of our neighbours and our community. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray now for our church. Father, we thank you for our Archbishop Glenn Davies and for our regional Bishop Gary Koo, and we pray that you will guide them and strengthen them through your Holy Spirit. We uphold John, our senior minister, and we pray for Keith and Paul and Ken as they minister to us, Thank you for the work of Joe Gibbs with those in need of love and care. We uphold Jeff and the team at St James. We thank you for the commencement of online ministry to our children and youth, and we pray that through this most modern of channels that we will connect with many and continue to communicate the true story of your gospel. Father, we continue to uphold Rich and Adrian and the whole production team and pray that they will be conscious of the positive impact that their work can have right now on all peoples. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray finally for ourselves. Father, we pray that we will all continue to be calm and patient and aware of the needs of others, looking to you for love and guidance, Help us to focus on the needs of our neighbour and to stay in touch whenever we can. Father, we pray now for those who are experiencing health, employment, financial or relationship difficulties, for those grieving and for those with acute medical issues. We bring all the people in our church community who are in need before you now in a moment of quiet. May all for whom we have prayed be aware of your mercy and your sustaining love through your Holy Spirit. We close our prayers now with the same verse from Psalm 80 as we read earlier. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Amen. Let's celebrate the Lord's Supper together. The Apostle Paul indicates the significance of eating and drinking together in remembrance of Jesus and his sacrifice in this way. He says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? 
And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share one loaf. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But these promises are accompanied by a warning. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So let us confess our sins and our need for the forgiveness and cleansing made possible by the sacrifice of God's Son, acknowledging that we share together in the benefits of Christ's death. Let us pray for genuine love and a proper regard for one another. Gracious Lord, we are not worthy to eat the crumbs from under your table, but your love compels us to draw near. We come with repentance and faith to express our need for all the benefits of your son's death for us. Renew us in your service and help us to love one another as members of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. We thank you, our Father, that in your love and mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our salvation. By this offering of himself once and for all time, Jesus made a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and commanded us to continue our remembrance of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may be partakers of his body and blood. Amen. On the night before he died, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the meal, he took the cup and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So come, let us eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Can I invite you now to take some bread? To take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Please join me in prayer. Loving Father, through faith in your Son and his saving death, our sins are forgiven and we share in the life of his body. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
As we finish, let's pray this prayer together. Father, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.